in general, I have to say that the quality of our entries has always been very, very high. But this year I was just blown away. There were so many super entries um, in terms of quality of the science, in terms of how good they were in writing. So we really liked it. And um, so it was in a way difficult for us to make a decision. My research is interested in neural circuits in the basal ganglia, which is a part of the brain that controls movement. And it's also a part of the brain that becomes dysfunctional in a number of movement disorders, including Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, dystonia, Tourette syndrome, and a number of other devastating disorders. And I'm really interested in understanding how neurons in the brain communicate with each other and wire up to form circuits, how they function to generate behavior in the first place, and why is it that after 60 years of Parkinson's research, we have not yet figured out exactly how to correct the circuit and correct what's wrong. The hope is that in the future, we can turn this basic understanding of how the brain is working at the neural circuit level and transform that into better approaches for disease therapies. I study the way that our internal cognitive states, what's going on in our head, what we're thinking about, affects our ability to perceive the world around us. So in particular, I focus on the neural basis of vision. And we've studied, and the field has studied for a long time, the way that different cognitive states affect vision. And in particular, one that we focus on is visual attention. So you can be looking at one thing and focusing on something else. So you might have a conversation with somebody, but you might hear something very interesting in the background. You might sort of focus your attention off on the periphery. And we know a lot about what that process does, both in the brain and to our ability to see. So the reason you do focus your attention somewhere else is that that lets you see better over there. But what we wondered was, well, what happens when your attention wanders? What happens when your attention, you, you're supposed to be paying attention to one thing, but your attention really drifts somewhere else? How does that affect your ability to see? And so ch attention changes the firing rates of neurons in visual cortex. And we measured the responses of groups of neurons in visual cortex to get a hint of when animals' attention was wandering. And then we measured their ability to see. And it turns out, that by recording from just a few dozen neurons, you can really tell very precisely when somebody's attention has wandered, and it has a huge effect on their ability to see subtle things. So for us as scientists, that's an exciting thing because it tells us we can record enough neurons to know very precisely where someone's focus of attention is, and that will allow us in the future, we hope to learn things about how attention works and also about how other cognitive states might, might affect perception and might affect the brain. One of the things that I enjoy most about my research is the ability to watch what cells are doing. So the primary technique that I use is called electrophysiology. And you take a fine glass pipette and put it up next to a cell. You poke a little hole in the cell so you can kind of gain access and see what the cell is doing. All of the electrical activity that it's computing and then when it fires an action potential, the output of the cell, how that's being propagated to other cells in the circuit. And I just find that endlessly fascinating, this ability to peer in at how the brain is working. I enjoy a lot of things about my research, and, you know, from the day-to-day -day just tinkering in the lab. But for me, the, the big questions are the most exciting. So everything we know about the world around us, we know because of the firing of neurons in our brains. And what I get to do is listen to those neurons firing and try to understand the code that, that translates the world around us to what we know about it. I don't think that anyone enters a contest like this thinking that they had a very strong chance of, of winning the prize. But for me, even the process of entering the contest um, w was very useful because I think being able to describe your research to a general audience is something we really have to do as scientists and something we don't do nearly enough. And so I was um, excited for that challenge and thrilled and shocked that I, that I ended up winning. <laughs> I think my advice for other people thinking about entering the contest is you should do it because first of all, somebody has to win every year and it, and it might as well be you. And I think that also the process of writing that essay about thinking about how to talk about your research to a more general audience is really a useful thing for all of us as scientists and, and as people. I would say don't be afraid, go for it. Um, 
there is always a good chance that you can win. Keep in mind that the others who are competing um, will also be good, so try to put in this little extra effort. But um, if you don't put your hat in the ring, you will never be chosen. One of the, the really nice things about this prize is that it focuses on young scientists. And I, I just started my lab a year ago. And I hope that, that this prize will draw attention to the sort of work that we do and hopefully get other young scientists interested in doing this type of research.